Hey, Sanctus Church, welcome back to another in our series out of Esther called Glimpses of God. Now, today's going to be interesting. You're like, today's going to be interesting. Hasn't the whole series been interesting? Yep. But one of the critical questions that's now facing us as Canadian Christians living in a post-Christian, growing post-secular, neo-pagan, COVID-living, government oversight moment in Canada is this. When is it okay to break the law because you are a Christian? Now, it's not as often as some of you want it to be, and yet it's probably more often than some others and your Canadian comfortability will allow. Now, again, to use an old Pentecostal phrase, this is a word in season. Esther is such an amazing book because it's one of the times where we see, we've seen it, Esther and Mordecai, both break the law for the greater good because of faith. So let's where, let's begin where we started last week, Esther 4.12. When Esther's words were reported to Mordecai, he sent back this answer. Do not think that because you are in the king's house, you alone of all the Jews will escape. For if you remain silent at this time, relief and deliverance for the Jews will arise from another place. But you and your father's family will die. And who knows, but maybe you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. There's that famous phrase. Here, here's the point. God had placed Esther in the palace, in this pagan government, in this time for his purposes. Mordecai rightly states he knows God's historic promises that the Jews will never fully be destroyed. He knows that a power will come and save them whether through her or someone else. But he also understands the power of one person and how one person can change everything. If you just read history, you see this. Maybe you don't know this. In 1645, one vote gave Oliver Cromwell control of England. England. In 1649, one vote was all the difference between Charles I living and, and dying. In 1776, south of the border in the United States, maybe you don't know this, it was one vote that made English the formal language of the United States and not, ready everyone? German. Did you know that? In 1923, one vote gave Hitler control of the Nazi party. On April 17th, 1999, one vote brought down the Indian parliament. It had never been done before in a non-confidence vote. And by one vote, the prime minister lost his job. One person can make such a difference, whether good or evil. And when one person is placed by God into a situation, even one person can change the world. But they have to be, ready, willing to partner with God to do the God-inspired daring thing. Well, last week we heard Esther's response to Mordecai, and it was powerful. She says in verse 16 in chapter 4, You go and gather all the Jews who are in Susa. And fast from me. Don't eat or drink for three days, night or day, and I, my attendants, will fast also. And when this is done, I will go to the king, even though it goes against the law. If I die, I die. Three days, three nights. Pause. This is so important. This runs through the whole Bible. It was on the third day, Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, and God sent an angel to stop him. Jacob was running from Laban, and he was going to really hurt Jacob. And on the third day, God stopped Laban. Jonah was in the belly of a fish for three days and three nights. Hosea had the promise of a full restoration on the third day. See, this is all pointing us, including the Esther, to the most important three days and three nights. Good Friday, Holy Saturday, Easter, where actually the world would be changed forever. Even here in Esther, all is lost and death is close. But hope, catch this, not optimism, hope, real God-given, historic, historically rooted hope in God himself and his promises is being found. Okay, back to the story. So much is at stake, and yet God can handle anyone. By the way, have you thought about that this week? God is not taken back. God is not afraid. God is not intimidated by anyone, including everyone with power, military might, those with the best laid plans. Okay, Esther 5, verse 1. On the third day, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. And the king was seated, seated on his royal throne in the hall facing the entrance. So on the third day, she puts on her royal robes. Now, in the original Hebrew, it's amazing. It reads like this. Esther wore the kingdom. Oh, she prepped. She came dressed for success. She knew that she might die, so she was going to look amazing if she was going to die. She was dressed to kill, no pun intended. 
She knows strategically the king would see her in the inner court before she entered into the forbidden court. Now again, let's remind ourselves, what she is doing is illegal. It is against the law. The king is seated, seated in his amazing 350 square foot audience hall. If you talk to historians, they will tell you they have found pictures of this audience hall. And the king is always seated on this grand throne. And in his, in his hand is a golden scepter. But what's missing from the biblical text, which we know from history, is there was a soldier stationed beside that throne with a large axe. He was not there to guard the king. If you entered into the courtroom without permission, you died. You got beheaded right in that room. If you got in and got caught, you die. Are you feeling how serious and dangerous this, dangerous this is? Esther is looking at her husband, but also looking at the man with the ax. So after three days of fasting, she goes in and she breaks the law. Would she live? Would she die? Well, the, king, king, the queen comes in all of her royal, breathtaking beauty. And it says in verse 2, When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her, held out his golden scepter, which was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Can you imagine the relief? She's not killed. She's in the door. The ax was not lifted and she was not beheaded. But there's so much danger on the other side of this door. The real dangerous moment has now just begun. Uh, the king asked the queen, uh, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half my kingdom, it will be given to you. Maybe you didn't catch it. This is the first time she's called Queen Esther. And we would expect her to go, oh, let me tell you, husband, how serious this is. You need to get this guy named Haman. He's an evil man. He wants to murder your queen. Nope. No revenge, no screaming, just trust and timing. Oh, if it pleases the king, let the king together with Haman come today to a banquet I've prepared for him. She's already prepared the banquet. She knows her husband loves a good banquet. She's dressed like she's walking on some Paris runway. She's looking for the right place for the real conversation to come. But notice she subtly shifts the place of power. She moves the conversation from the audience hall and the king's banquets to her part of the palace. But more, she's the opposite of Queen Vashti in chapter 1. More subtle, less confrontational. And she's preparing the real setup for Haman later. Verse 5, the king says, bring Haman at once. So we may do what Esther asks. Just remember that. So the, so the king and Haman went to the banquet Esther had prepared, and they were drinking wine. And the king again asked Esther, what is your petition? It will be given to you. And what is your request? Even up to half my kingdom, it will be granted. And Esther replied, well, my petition and my request is this. If the king regards me with favor, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, let the king and Haman come tomorrow to the banquet I will prepare for them. Then I'll answer the king's question. By the way, she's not hesitating. This isn't fear or weakness, second guessing. This is strategic and tactical. And notice, ready? Both the king and Haman follow the will of Esther, a woman. It's the total opposite of the command in chapter 1 that the king sent out. But deeper than this, this is just holy waiting. This is God's timing. But things are far from okay, by the way. After this banquet, all the Jews are still going to be killed. After this banquet, Haman goes home and his wife and others encourage him to set up a poll so they can publicly impale Mordecai. Whoa. But let's stop. And what we really need to focus on today is Queen Esther's religiously inspired civil disobedience. Mordecai earlier broke the law when he refused to bow down to Haman, even though the king had made it law. And there are so many other moments in the Bible where God's people say no. We're not going to obey the government. In the story of the Exodus, the midwives were told to kill every single baby boy, and they refused to do it. And when Pharaoh asked, they lied about it. Daniel and his friends broke the law a hundred years earlier, not worshiping the king, not bowing down to the idols. So when does God give us his holy yes for civil disobedience? When are you Daniel? And when are you Esther? Or when are you sinning? And you might think you're Esther, but actually you're not Esther at all. Now, this really matters these days. And again, go back and listen to my intro in week one. With all the things we're wrestling with, to obey or not obey, the government is good Canadian Christian citizens. Well, to find out what God's boundaries are around civil disobedience, because you are a Christian, we need to actually go back 
to Paul's writing, and he outlines in Romans 13 how to become an Esther in 2021. Now, when you're turning to Romans 13, let me give you some background. The Emperor Claudius has just expelled all the Jews from Rome because a dispute had arisen among them. You see that in the book of Acts, by the way. After a period of time, they're allowed to return, but it was tense. Claudius dies, and Paul writes the book of Romans. And it is being written during the middle of Nero's reign, which we'll talk about in a minute. This is a really tough place to be a Christian. In Rome, there's growing anti-Semitism, and most Christians at this point are Jewish also. There's a growing anti-Christian sentiment, and it's growing very quickly. And Paul also, with all that going on, realizes he has to address this because many Christians in Rome are being influenced by zealots back in Jerusalem with almost a religiously inspired terroristic worldview against Rome. And yet another wrong attitude was also starting to form, which Paul needed to address. That was the thinking, well, I'm a Christian and Jesus is coming back and he's going to make everything okay. So why would I even get involved in civic affairs? It's all a waste of time. It's all sinful. Just run away and let God deal with all the mess. But Paul won't allow that either. So he is about to charge us as Christians to what some call horizontal grace. This is how you become Esther right now. Since God has given us grace and mercy and kindness, We must do this horizontal grace with Christians and those who run our country. Responsible citizenship is at the heart of Christian worship. Romans 13.1, let everyone be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. Okay, if you're a Christian listening to me today, you've named Jesus Savior, Leader, and Lord then Paul says directly, you have no choice. We have no choice. You must be subject under the government. This is the word submission. It's a military term, voluntary deference to the wishes of the government. Put yourself there willingly. God's word says it right here, black and white. God has established the government. They may be good, they may be bad. But God always uses them to accomplish his purposes. One wrote it like this. After God created the world, he filled it, he organized it, he gave purpose to each created thing. When governments establish laws and prosecute justice, they honor his created order. Even when they don't do it perfectly, anarchy, however, is bad for everyone. So in other words, Paul says, if you're a Christian, you obey the law, you remain productive, you pay your taxes, you stop stop at red lights, you don't steal, you don't invade someone else's privacy or their their property, You, you don't rob banks. All of these things are good, but common good, lean in, is not enough. See, this is about worship for Christians. Notice the power of the statement. Paul says that God established the government, and resisting the government is fighting against God's plan and authority. Many of you who are listening to me right now, and you still haven't turned me off, I'm thankful, you just don't like the government. You post against the government 24-7. So I just want you to stop and ask, when is the last time you said, God has allowed this government right now, and it's His will? Now, I know what a lot of you are saying. Oh, no, no, but you don't... Hold on. Of course, Romans 13 has been misused. This is not teaching blind devotion to the government. Many churches under Hitler used Romans 13 to teach either we can't stand up or we should not stand up. We're going to get to the question of, like in the life of, like, like in the life of Esther, when is it okay not to obey? But see, many of you are already jumping there and you're yelling at your screens, but you're going there too quickly. Stop. Just let this sink in. Your worship is connected to your thoughts and your actions to those that God has given authority over us. This is as important as you raising your hands and singing songs on a Sunday morning. This is worship. (laughs) Verse 2, Consequently, whoever rebels against the authorities rebelling against what God has instituted, and those who do will bring judgment on themselves. How are you feeling about your Twitter feed, your Instagram feed? 
There are two reasons why we should obey. First, it allows us to worship to please God and honor Him. Second, it allows us to serve God freely. If we disobey the laws all the time, we get a bad reputation, there are fines, we've put in prison, it removes the space for us to serve. It was Richard Halverson, the former chaplain of the United States Senate, that wrote, to be sure, <laughs> men will abuse and misuse the institution of the state. People, because of sin, have abused and misused every other institution in history, including the church. But this does not mean that the institution is bad or should be thrown out. It simply means that men and women are sinners and rebels in God's world. And this is the way they behave when handling good institutions. As a matter of fact, it is because of this very sin that there must be human government to maintain order in history until the final and ultimate rule of Jesus is established. Human government is better than anarchy, and the Christian must recognize the divine right of the state. Let that sink in. God invented this. Verse 3, rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong, do you want to be free from fear? of the one who's in authority, then do what is right and you'll be commended. Now, this is not saying in all places, all times. This is a general rule. In general, obey and things go better for you. If you break the law and resist the law, you're always looking over your back. But if you obey, you will not have to fear. Verse four, for the one in authority is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason. They are God's servants. Agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Now watch this. God has given the authority of law and consequence to the government. And here's the real shocking thing, again, that should be a little jarring for a lot of you and reorienting. Do you see how politicians and leaders are called God's servants? This is the same word used for deacons in the church and priests in the Old Testament temple. So when is the last time you said Doug Ford or Jatmet Singh or Justin Trudeau or King of Xerxes is God's servant? That might give a lot of you a different lens to process some stuff through. Therefore, verse 5, it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. This is also why you pay your taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time to governing. This is the best summary. We don't just obey the government because we don't want to get in trouble or lose time or reputation or money. We also obey as Christians as a matter of conscience. That is, it is God's will we obey and we love God and want to follow him. So we do it as worship. Now, Jewish Christians 2000 years ago were struggling with this because it was a pagan government. It wasn't a greed issue. It was a holiness issue. And even in the time of Jesus, Jews really struggled with and did not want to pay taxes to Caesar. Basically, for us today, it's like, well, maybe I don't want to pay taxes because my tax money goes to abortion or euthanasia or buying tanks. Yeah. But what did Jesus even teach Orthodox Jews in Matthew 20, 21? Give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and give what to God what is God's. So Paul simply teaches, pay your taxes, it's for the common good, and worship. And then he comes even closer to home. Verse 7, give to everyone what you owe them. <laughs> if you owe taxes, you pay taxes. If you owe revenue, you pay your bills. If you owe them respect, you give them respect. If it's honor, then honor. We are called as Christians to fulfill the requirements of good citizenship. By doing this, it just might create the opportunities to share the good news with greater freedom. Respect and honor are key. As one preached, as Christians, we may deplore the politics of a particular person in office. We may be repelled by his or her scandalous conduct, but that does not disallow us any form of respecting the office they hold. Do you honor who God has placed over you and over us? Really? I mean, what did Peter say? 1 Peter 2, 13, submit yourself for Jesus' sake to every human authority, whether the emperor, a supreme authority, or governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. Show proper respect to everyone. Love the family of believers. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Peter says that our holiness, our godly living, 
is connected to one word we all hate. It's a jocking, uh, it's a shocking, jarring word. Submission. What does the word submission mean? Subject to, subordinate, order yourself under. Now, Peter says, submit to every authority instituted, including, well, Nero. Paul and Peter are writing during the time of Nero. In 64 AD, the famous Roman fire broke out and many died. And everyone looked at Nero and said, you did this. But here's what one historian tells us. Nero, always a man desperate to be popular, therefore looked for scapegoats on whom the fire could be blamed. And he found it in this obscure new religious sect called Christians. And so many Christians were arrested and thrown to wild beasts in the circus, and they were crucified. Some were burned alive at, to death at night, and they served as his lamps at his parties. That is why Nero was called the very first antichrist in the eyes of the Christian church in the first 60 years. And Peter and Paul say we must honor and respect Nero. Okay, everyone. If we're called to honor and respect Nero, you can respect and honor anyone right now, right? Now, hold on. I know some of you are like freaking out. Hold on. Let's understand what these passages are not saying. <laughs> Paul, Peter, Mordecai, Esther, they're not naive about government abuse and power. They've all been abused by governments more than once. They even know that behind the authority and power of the government, sometimes, much of the time, are spiritual forces that are hostile to God. So can we ever disagree? Can we choose not to obey? Yes, of course. On rare occasions, on rare occasions, we have no choice to obey, but to obey God over the government. Now, don't forget, Paul never shares what form of government is best, nor does Peter, nor does Mordecai, nor does Esther. He doesn't tell us what to do in the middle of a revolution. But what we do get from the scriptures are, there are three times where we are allowed to rebel civically because we are Christians. One, when the government tells us to violate a direct command of God revealed in the Bible, we just disagree and disobey. In Acts 4 and 5, the Jewish Sanhedrin said that James and John could not preach in the name of Jesus. They said back, we must obey God rather than men. The command of God always takes precedent. So if anyone says to us in our culture, you cannot say Jesus is the Son of God or the only way to heaven, if we are suddenly told we can't tell people from other faiths or atheists that they're on their way to hell because they haven't accepted Jesus, right? Or if we can't call people to repentance, if we're told we can't speak about life or gender or sexuality from a biblically informed worldview, we will lovingly not obey. We will resist. No. Now, the second time is if we are told to commit an immoral or an unethical act. If we are told you must lie, you must steal, you must kill, such as no Christian doctor or nurse should have to take life in the womb or the aging as an example. Now, you might lose your job if you say no. You might be demoted, but you obey God rather than people. If your boss tells you to change some notes or lie on some reports, you say no. I am a Christian. I do not lie. No in Jesus' name. Now, the third one is this. If something goes against a Christian's conscience that is informed by Scripture and the Spirit of God. Now, there's no agreement between Christians on every single matter. Some of you could never work, for example, on nuclear weapons or, or work in the entertainment industry. Others say, well, of course I'm in those industries. I'm salt and light in that mixed environment. A classic one is war and pacifism. Some say... There is a time that Christians need to pick up arms, defend the weak, and remove an evil government, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer and that whole community with Hitler. Others say, no, Jesus is the Prince of Peace. We are never to take up arms. Both of their views are rooted in Scripture. Now, here's the point. We live in a moment where everyone has access to a million thoughts on the internet. Very few of them are fact-checked. And there is a growing suspicion of experts. So I just want to say this, don't use number three as an excuse because you've read, you know, three posts, two websites, and you're in an echo chamber of your own thoughts. It's got to be deeply informed by scripture. The Holy Spirit has to be involved. And so does community.
There's no little rangers in this, in this moment. Okay, so where does this leave us? Okay, one, honor your leaders. We saw this even with Esther and Mordecai, with a king who was quite evil. Peter says in 1 Peter 2.17, Show proper respect to everyone. Love the church, fear God, honor the emperor. Respect every person you meet. All people, people of different religions, different politics, different views, different moralities, different sexualities. Treat them with dignity. Treat them the way you want to be treated. This does not mean you have to agree with them or justify what they believe or condemn or, or condone how they act. But remember, human dignity for a Christian is directly connected that every single human being is made in the image of God. Not their money, not their status, not their power, not their ethnicity, not their skin color. No, no. They're made in the image of God. When you remove God, you remove human dignity. By the way, this teaching we're seeing in Paul and Peter had never been seen before in human history. Not like this. Because everyone's made in the, in the image of God and because of what Jesus has done, oh my goodness, we love everyone. So let me ask this question again, open-handed. Does anyone in Sanctus Church or beyond need to repent because you have not honored the government? I think a lot of people need to work that through. It is just important to God as your hand raising and singing or your Bible study. Because God has instituted the government and God has placed who those who are leading us right now, he's, he's allowed them to be here. He's allowed them to be here. So honor your leaders. How are you doing with that? Number two, pray for our leaders. First Timothy 2, 1. I urge you then, first of all, that petitions and prayers and intercessions and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings, for those in authority, that we may live peaceable, peaceful and quiet lives in godliness and holiness. When's the last time you prayed for our prime minister? When's the last time you prayed for your MP or MPP or our mayor or, or your mayor or, 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 or the premier? Now, let me help you pastorally. This is what it does not mean. Oh God, I pray that our prime minister would understand how ungodly he is and if he would just think like me. Well, why don't you ask the living God to show up in his life? Yeah, you can pray, for example, he needs to reorient some things. But have you prayed for his family? Have you prayed for his wife and his kids? Have you prayed blessing on him? Remember, Paul instructs us under the Spirit of God, not just to honor those we agree and disagree with over us, but also to pray into their lives. Not just they'd be saved, though pray that please. Not just that they'd get it, but actually they'd be blessed. That they'd have wisdom. How much time do you pray for those who are over us? Here's the third one, and this might be difficult for some of you, but it's important I say it. You don't get to break the law because the law might be used in a wrong way later. Let me just use this COVID moment as an example. Uh, the Canadian government and the provincial governments have not told us that we can't preach or, or share our faith. Now, they have asked us to do it in a different way for a period of time. A am I tired of this? Uh, yes and no. This has been actually a great moment to learn online so we can reach more of the world later. But do I want to be a church in gatherings with you? Yes. Do I want to sing with you? Yes. Do I want to say, take communion with you? Yes. Do I miss seeing your faces? Yes. Do I, oh, all these things. But as some of my friends have kept their churches open during these COVID moments, and actually some of my friends were the ones who got arrested, here's my only struggle. And there are brothers in Jesus and I love them. But let me just say this, when I listened closely to what they were saying, they kept saying, if we don't stand now, all of this will be used against us later and we'll never be able to really do church again. Here's the problem with that. A, I don't necessarily agree with that idea because I don't think that's fully happening. But even if it was, you don't get to preemptively break the law because it might be used wrongly later. So let me just say this. As we come out of this pandemic, if the government ever tried to work out restrictions that were no longer valid or even conceivable, trust me, I'm the first one who's probably going to be arrested too. But we're not there. In other words, just because something could be misused doesn't mean we have the right to break the law now. Oh, does this mean you can never voice your opinion? Of course you can. Uh, of course you can. Does this mean that we should vote really carefully? 
Of course it does. Does this mean we should try influencing the laws toward godliness? Yes. Should we be involved? Yes. But your tone matters. And context matters. And truth matters. Oh, and the gospel matters most of all. I'm okay with people connecting to one political party or another. I've never taught against that. But don't forget the thing that lasts is the gospel. So honor your leaders. Pray for your leaders. Don't preemptively break laws if they're not directly saying no yet or yes. And then lastly, yes, you can break the law. Only when the Bible gives you the yes. Now, might it happen in Canada? Maybe. Might we lose jobs, be publicly lied about? Yeah. Might there be a time coming where actually we move from this grayish, mushy middle to actually, man, it's the time of Esther? Possibly. And we got to get ready. If you're a parent, you might have to stand up for your kids and say, no, not, not for me in my house. Are you a teacher? Are you a lawyer? Are you a nurse? Are you a doctor? Are you a politician? Are you a plumber, a banker? Whoever you are, when the moment comes, when the moment really comes, you will have to have the Holy Spirit courage, courage to say, no, I, I will not comply. But let's not break the law before the time is called for. So here's what I want you to think about in your life and also in your family and in your thinking. What do you need to change about your thinking so it actually looks way more Christian than politically driven right now? Number two, what do you need to repent of? Thoughts, actions, posts. What do you need to keep working out? What's unclear to you? What is not like, oh my goodness, I get that. And are you prepared to civilly disobey if we have to? So I'm just going to pray that the Holy Spirit speaks and leads our church and us as individuals, and that God's Word has the final say, not only in these difficult moments, but actually for the run that's coming. So thanks, God, that you love us. Thanks that a new kingdom is coming that is perfect, and we can't wait for it. Thanks that you sustained us during this middle point that's been so difficult. And here's what we pray. Number one, would you, Holy Spirit, convict any of us that have not honored those who we're supposed to submit to? Number two, would you lead Sanctus Church and those listening beyond to pray for our leaders? Number three, would you begin to show us where maybe we have done things that you're not pleased with? We thought we were Esther, but actually we weren't. Also, Lord, teach us to how to, how to do this well. Um, there won't be complete unity among us, even, Lord, on the conscience issue. But would you teach us to love each other, but also to really be rooted in Scripture? God, just your will be done. Help us to do this well. Help us to live well with the kingdom of God. Be deeply formed at Sanctus Church during this difficult moment. And, and may we continue to keep in step with the Spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name and we all said together, Amen.